praise Jesus. It is our, our last uh, time here, praise Jesus. That does mean that we are packing up and we're moving everything into the van today too. So, so uh, if you can hang around a bit and help us. We're not just sliding it to another room, we're sliding it out the building into the vans and stuff. So, so that means I'm going to try to preach uh, briefer so that uh, we could do that. You, you keep me on task, honey? Thank you. Appreciate that. All right. Well, praise the Lord. We're starting a new series. I was hoping to start a new series in a new building. But anyways, you know, hope deferred makes the heart sick. I felt a little heart sick. I was really disappointed. But along and fulfilled is a tree of life, you know. So anyway, I tell you, I was really happy just... We at least got the sign up, you know what I mean? So, so, you know, I can remember when I was showing you guys pictures of here's what it's going to look like. Remember when it was just in our heads? It was just in our minds? It was just something we were thinking about and hoping for? At least the sign's up, you know what I mean? So the sign's really there, and, uh, you know, it looks really cool. Lights up at night, not yet. It's hooked up on Monday. But I tell you, people drove by and they went, oh my goodness, you can't miss that. That just creates curiosity. So it's like, bam, over here. So I was like, that is a good looking sign. Yeah, it's a good looking sign. So, so I was very excited about that. So that's uh, inside. That's, uh, you know, so, I mean, that's, uh, that's a picture. We haven't quite finished everything, but the guys came and put up the, the baby grand there the other day. So I took a little picture and there's, uh, there's Brad and Keith. Uh, we hung the doors. They're putting hardware on the doors there. And so there are some little finishing pieces and things going on, but uh, it's pretty exciting to see what's going on. It just needs a real clean because it is dusty in there, and we got to clean. So really, all the next week, if you're thinking, trust me, I'll be there. I'll be there. I'll be there. I will be there. <laughs> so, uh, and, and, you know, really pray. Pray for favor. Pray for favor with uh, the city and all the different things that these inspectors will, you know, uh, check the boxes. And uh, I don't know anywhere else where you can be five months behind and it's okay. I mean, can you imagine running your own business and somebody orders something? He's like, hey, you know, I was saying, imagine when you serve a nursing home and they need food for all their clients. And we say, hey, it'll be there in five months. I mean, the whole place, they'd all die. I mean, it's just, it's just, anyway. I regress. There's no, there's no competition. I can't go to St. Thomas and say, would you guys sign off on this? You know, praise the Lord. Amen. Anyway, there you go. It's pretty exciting. And uh, we are going to be in there next week, don't matter what. So uh, welcome to the sermon series called Summer Stories that we're going to start right now. So this one is the key to understanding. So we're going to deal with Jesus' stories. We're going to talk about the parables. But this sermon is the key to understanding. And this is very, very important. If you're going to talk about parables, there's one parable that you have to start with. And you have to start with that parable because that parable is the key to understanding all the other parables. True story. Mark chapter 4, 13. Then Jesus said that if you can't understand the meaning of this parable, how will you understand any of the other? So we can't start with another parable and come back to it. We've got to start with this one because there's a key in this parable to unlock all the rest of the parables. And we've got to under, understand what that is before we move on. Because there's some great parables and I can't wait to get to them. But we've got to start with the sower and the seed, the sower and the soils. And this is the one that we have to pay attention to. But the ones that fell on the good ground are those who, having heard the word with a noble good heart, keep it and bear fruit with patience. Whew. Amen. That word patience, patience means constant endurance and persistence. And so we're persisting that we're going to realize what God's put in our heart in this city and in this region and what he's called us to do even in this new location. We cannot wait to fully express what he's put in our hearts. But that means we've got to start with the story. All right, so we're going to start, we're going to have the story, the sting, the story, the sting, and the strategy. So that's where we're at today, all right? The story, the sting, and the strategy. So here we are. We're going to go to Matthew chapter 13, all right? Matthew chapter 13, and I'm going to read 3 to 23 because that's the story. All right, here we go. Here's the story. He told many stories in the form of parables, such as this one. One of them is this one, such as this one. So here's the first word in the parable. You ready? Listen! 
And the reason I raise my voice is because there's an exclamation mark on listen, right? How many read stories to your kids and you see an exclamation mark? You bring some emphasis, right? So Jesus started the story with, listen, listen. He said, listen, a farmer went out to plant some seeds, and as he scattered them across his field, some fell on the footpath, some fell, and the birds came and ate them. Others fell on the shallow soil and, and the underlying, with underlying rock. Some fell on, it sprouted up quickly because the soil was shallow, but the plant soon withered under the hot sun, and since they did not have a root system, they died. Verse 7, and other seeds fell among the thorns and grew up, and they choked it out, uh, since they didn't have, uh, it stoked out the tender plants. Verse 8, still other seeds fell on fertile soil. They produced a crop that was 30, 60, even 100 times as much as had been planted. Isn't that great? I mean, you want to plant something, get 30 times? You want to plant, and 30, it's not 30, a 30 addition, it's 30 times. It's 30 fold, it's folded in, it's multiplied over and over itself, and it says some even a hundred fold. Verse 9, it says, anyone with ears to hear should listen and understand. Anyone with ears to hear should listen and understand. It's a very important parable, and this parable is the key to understand. Understanding all the other parables. See how he drank right mid-sentence? That was good. Verse 10. And his disciples came and asked him, why do you use parables when you talk to people? Why do you use parables? Jesus, why do you use parables? A, a lot of commentators, uh, theologians, deep-thinking people, uh, they say there was a shift in Jesus' ministry where suddenly he started to go into a storytelling mode. Now, some people would say, well, stories are great. Stories open windows, and they help you understand, you know, the truth. But that's not why Jesus told stories. They asked him, why are you telling stories? And, they ans and Jesus answered them. So the answer isn't whatever you might think or some other person in a book might think. The answer is exactly what Jesus answered. So if you got that question, Jesus answered it. He said, why do you use parables when you talk to the people? He replied, to the people, to the people. See, Jesus got kicked out of all the synagogues. Jesus was, was ushered out of all the places where he could teach to, you know, all the people in those places of, of traditional sharing and learning and sermonizing. And now he was teaching on the hillsides, teaching from, from boats. In fact, this parable was taught from a boat. Pushed off the boat because there was a large, large crowd. So he, he borrowed Peter's boat and he said, push off from the shore. And he, he showed them what the miracle was after that. He showed them what it was when you could take the word and honor the word. He showed them what happened when you take the seed of the word and you honor that word and you walk in the word and yet the power of that word manifested in your heart. He showed them what happened because Peter, in the middle of the day, when you don't catch fish, threw out his nets and he got a net breaking increase. You can get that kind of a harvest if you do what Jesus says. You can get that kind of a harvest when you open your heart to the word of God when you trust the word of God you're going to see that manifest in your life so he didn't just tell a story he gave them a massive illustration from that boat and they saw a boat sinking increase and from that point the disciples got up and they left a massive huge catch the catch of their lives they left behind because this guy says let there be catch I'm going to follow the one who says, let there be catch every moment of my life. I'm not going to live off of that miracle. I'm going to follow the miracle. I'm going to live in that miracle every day of my life. So that's what it's all about. He said, why do you do that? So why do you talk in parables? And he replied, you are permitted to understand the secrets of the kingdom of heaven, but others are not. Those who are listening to my teaching, more understanding will be given, but they, talking about the people, they will have uh, they, well, those will have an abundance of knowledge, but for those who are not listening, even what little understanding they have will be taken from them. That is why I use parables. So he literally uses parables as a form of judgment for those people who should have embraced who he was. And now they should have known who I was. I taught, they booted me out, they've rejected me. And now my teaching has shifted to a new way. The disciples, those who I want to understand, those who've been given ears to understand the mysteries of the kingdom, they're going to walk in that deeper revelation. But those people who have rejected me, even what they have will be taken from them. So even stories and parables were a form of judgment. 
They weren't to open windows. They were literally to close people's heads and close their minds. And so that they would not understand the deeper things of the kingdom. That just doesn't sound right, does it? But that's what Jesus said, this is why I use parables. I use parables so that they won't understand, and even what they do have will be taken from them. That, verse 13, that is why I use these parables. Boom. Okay, 14. This fulfills the prophecy in Isaiah. It's in Isaiah 6, 9 to 10. So this is a fulfillment of prophecy when he says, when you hear what I say, you will not understand. When you see what I do, you will not comprehend. For the hearts of these people are hardened and their ears cannot hear and they have closed their eyes so they cannot see. And their ears cannot hear and their hearts cannot understand and they cannot turn to me and let me heal them. See, they have rejected, they have resisted, they have turned, they have completely repelled, and they've gone so long that literally, it's not that, it's not that he doesn't want them to hear. Their hearts have become so hardened that the seed can't even get in the soil. So it's about hearts. It's about hearts. So he says... Uh, you are permitted to understand, but they are not. That is why I use parables. Verse 14, this fulfills that prophecy. Isaiah chapter 5 is another interesting prophecy. And he says, I want to talk to you about my vineyard. He says, I did everything I could for my vineyard. I gave it the very best circumstance. I gave it the best surroundings. I provided everything for it. But when I came to it to get fruit, there was no fruit. And so he's saying, my people, I've done everything for my people. I've revealed myself clearly to my people. I've done everything possible for my people to bear fruit, but they have borne no fruit. And therefore, they will not see, they will not understand, and they will not experience healing. That's not because it's not God's will. It's because their hearts had become so hard to the word, they had so resisted the word, that it would no longer function in their lives. you got to understand this parable before you're going to understand any of the other parables. you got to understand this truth before you can manifest the fruitfulness of anything else that Jesus is teaching. Now, you must keep in mind that Jesus is teaching on the other side of the cross. He's teaching on the old covenant side of the cross, and you have to bear that in mind. Otherwise, I could really preach some condemnation right now. I could really hammer something. You know why? Pastor, why is my prayer not being answered? Because your heart is hard. Man, I could just hammer people that you're not performing enough. You're not praying enough. You're not, you're not, you're not passionate for Jesus. You're not hungry. You're not thirsty. And you can really hammer people into performance, couldn't you? Boy, how many can feel the knife just starting to penetrate a little? You're just like, ooh. We have to be careful. Who's he talking to? What's going on? Who are those people? Those people. I teach to those people this way. So, verse 16. But blessed are your eyes because they see, and blessed are your ears because they hear. And where do ears to hear and eyes to see come from? They come from the Lord. They come from the Lord. It's the blessing of God that we see and that we hear. I tell you the truth. Many prophets, even righteous people, they have longed to see what you see, but they didn't see. And all those who longed to hear what you hear, but they didn't hear. Now, listen to the explanation of the parable about the farmer planting seed. The seed that fell on the footpath represents those who hear the message about the kingdom and don't understand it. Then... The evil one comes and he snatches the seed away that was planted in their hearts. The seed on the rocky soil represents those who hear the message and lead immediately receive it with joy. But since they don't have uh, deep roots, it does not last long. They fall as soon as they have problems and are persecuted for believing the word. The seed that fell on the thorns represents those who hear God's word. But too quickly, the message is crowded out with worries. I mean, I was getting a little annoyed with that phrase, I have to tell you. Why do I worry? Why do I worry? Well, let's just, just stop. Why? But then I thought, man, I'm worried about a lot of things. I'm, I'm frustrated about a lot of things. I'm, I'm, I'm annoyed with, I'm like a stinking inspector. And I'm having a hard time loving some of these people right now. It's hard when you have to apply the sermon to yourself. <laughs> but there's times, you know, I, I, did God not say this is going to get done? He did. But... You know, I'm helping them. I'm, I'm pushing this sucker through, I'm telling you. Okay. All right, thanks for that. Amen. Now listen to the explanation. Fell on It fell away as soon as they had problems or were persecuted. As soon as they had the inspector tear holes in the wall. Shh, 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 shh. 
whoa, you, you just cut open our freshly painted walls. God loves you. <laughs> but, but I'm having a hard time following through with that. You know, but anyway. Hey, you know what? It, it was done right. All right, guys. Have a nice day. Anyways, where's that saw? <laughs> okay, sorry. No. All right, sorry. Jesus, I'm so sorry, Lord. Father, forgive me for being such a good example. Amen. So, yeah. Boy. But since it didn't have roots, didn't last long, fell among the thorns too quickly. It was crowded out by worries of life and the lure of wealth. So no fruit was produced. No fruit was produced. No fruit. Now this isn't just about, you know, salvation. It isn't just about the seed was the gospel. Some people received it, some didn't. Because it's not a one or the other thing. There's several analogies going on here. It's, it's people, you know, received and didn't receive for different reasons. And there's a lot more to the seed that God is pouring out than just you know, come to Jesus seeds. There's all kinds of words that he's speaking. There's the word, cast your net on the other side and receive a, an incredible haul. Like that was a seed, that was a word. There's words God speaking that aren't just come to me and be saved. There's words of blessing in your life that he's speaking over you that are having a hard time coming into manifestation because the soil of our heart ain't quite there. So we gotta guard our hearts above anything else, right? I want results in my life. I want fruit in my life. I want to manifest fruit unto the Almighty. Well, there's something's got to happen with our hearts because that's really the key to it all. So we got to make sure we're taking care of that. Right. All right. Okay, so verse 22 through verse 23. But the seed that fell on good soil represented those who truly hear and understand God's word and produce a harvest of 30, 60, or 100 times as much as had been planted. Can I get an amen? Now, how many want to just be the fruitful people? We just, we really do, we really do. All right, so there's a road. You see that right there? How many like pictures? All right, good. So there's, there's a road. You see the, the hard path right there? How many know if you put some seed on that hard path, what's going to happen to it? Not much. Like the birds are going to, really, I've seen it. You throw it out, the birds come and eat it. They go, oh, thank you. So, so here, though, you, you got some gravel, but you know there's some rocks, but there's probably some decent soil under there. And boom, you know, something pops up, but, you know, hot day like we had this week, that's not growing, it's not going anywhere. Now, the other seed could fall in the ditch where there's weeds and, and other things. It gets lost in there, and it might try to do something. It's going to get choked out by all the weeds. But imagine the seeds that fall over here on that fertile soil, boom. You see those little seeds that create incredible heads of multiplication, and you see results, you see things. So uh, I'm going, what kind of farmer would plant over there? But sometimes when you're planting, scattering the seeds, some blows out on the road, but it's not going to bear fruit. So he's saying right here, your heart's got to be like this. And when your heart's like this, you're going to see an incredible breakthrough in your life. Listen! So here's some lessons on how to make sure that you've got the right heart. Because blessed are the pure in heart, for they still see God, right? So we're going to have a how to get a pure heart conference right now. You ready? You ready? I'm going to give you 2,500 steps, and you got to fulfill every single one of them. Actually, there's only one step. The pure heart's a gift from God. Thank God we live on this side of the cross. See, those folks on the other side, that covenant was never even designed to work. It was designed to fail. It was to point us to our desperate need that the heart that's necessary to bring forth that kind of harvest, it's a gift of God. Let me just say that again. The heart that's necessary for the 30, 60, 100 fold, it's the gift of God. And the sad thing is, though, is that there's still new covenant preachers giving you all kinds of steps to try to create something that you can only receive. Create in me a clean heart, O oh God. See, God does it, and God has done it, and that is a full-on part of the whole package, that a pure heart comes from the Almighty. It's a true story. So you got the road, you got the gravel, you got the weeds and the thorns, and you got the good soil. And here's what you say, my heart is good soil. Father, there's real good soil right here. Now, even with the gift of good soil, though, honestly, we can still learn from this because I found even this week that I went home after we cut that hole in the wall and I was having some heartache. I was not manifesting a fruitful life after that because I allowed that guy 
to cut those holes in that wall. So be a vision on my head. He blocked something I wanted. And so the fruit of love, the fruit of patience, the fruit of long suffering, all those things, they were gonzoed. <laughs> Nothing wrong with the heart that God gave me, but man, I'll tell you, I got my eyes on nonsense and it just isn't worth it. You're still gonna have to fix the wall. You're still gonna have to ask the plumbers to come back and put it on. We're gonna have to be in the gymnasium for one more week. Hallelujah! All right, so that was the story, and here's the sting. You ready? Matthew 13, 11 to 16, you are permitted to understand the secret of the kingdom, but others are not. Wow. Others are not allowed. They're not allowed. But blessed are your eyes because they see and your eyes because they hear. John 5, 45 to 46, I could give you all kinds of places where Jesus rebuked the people of the day. You remember when Nicodemus, Nick came at night. I preached a sermon on that. I called it Nick at night. It was Nick at night coming to Jesus, asking questions, because he didn't want his friends to see, I'm checking out this Jesus guy. So he comes to Jesus, hey, how do you get the kingdom? How do we manifest that? How do... And Jesus said to him, ah, you must be born again. He's like, man, this guy, this guy and his stories and analogies, what, what, what are you talking about? I got to crawl back into my mother's womb? How creepy is that? What are you talking about? He said, Nicodemus, I can't believe that you're asking me a question. If you knew, and you're a scholar of the Word of God, you should know that you have to get a new heart. You, as a scholar of the Word of God, you should know, as in Jeremiah and Ezekiel says, I will come and I will put a clean heart in you. I will give you a new heart, and I will put my spirit in you. You must be born again. And you know what? That is a gift of God. It's not something we strive for. You know, it's a gift of God to get in. It's a gift of God to get the new heart. It's a gift of God to have His Spirit filling you. It's a gift of God to be empowered by Him. It's all a gift of God. And some of the biggest struggles we have today is that we're teaching, you know, striving. We're teaching on how to earn it. How to, how to get yourself finally in the place where God could use you. You're never going to do that. And we got people on these religious treadmills trying to be new covenant people with an old covenant model. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. But here's what he said. He said, yet it isn't I who will accuse you. Jesus said, I'm not accusing you. You say Moses is your father. So, so I'm not going to accuse you before my father. Moses will accuse you. Yes, Moses, who you put your hopes in. If you really did believe Moses, you would believe me because he wrote about me. And there's people using the handles of Moses, the laws of Moses, the old covenant patterns and types, and they're trying to get a new covenant result with the old. See, the old covenant people have worked so hard in their performance world. We've achieved status before God. Look at us. And then Jesus comes and says, hogwash, just believe. Well, this guy's going to ruin everything we've worked so hard for. He's going to take away all of our toys. We're prestigious in the kingdom. You're nothing. There's the sting. If you believed Moses, and if you, Moses, is your father, you would believe me because he spoke about me. If you're really scholars of the Old Covenant, you'd understand it doesn't work. And you understand that the Old Covenant speaks of me. When Jesus was on the road to Emmaus, these guys were walking away from their destiny, beat up, their hearts crushed, broken, saw the hope their future dashed they saw the drywall cut open and no no they 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 saw jesus their hope put on the cross jesus heal me and they thought it's over and they're walking away to emmaus which means they're going to go have a warm bath how many just you need a warm bath and someday i'm just going to light some candles and have a hot bath it was one of those days but jesus you know what even in that situation jesus catches up with you even when you've had enough and you're walking away and you said, I'm done with this. He catches up with you. And he catches up. And what did Jesus do? All the way through the Old Testament, he taught them about himself. What's all this written for? It's written to show Jesus. That's what it's about. It's not written to reinforce a whole bunch of rules and performance to try to make your, I'm going to try to make my heart acceptable to God. Good luck with that. You, if you really had Moses as your father, boom, boom you got to realize he wrote about me. So there's the sting of the storyteller. The storytellers were to keep people lost. 
people with hard hearts, people with religious spirits, people who are bogged down and messed up a tradition, you won't hear a thing, and even what you have will be taken from you. Wow, that's a sting. It doesn't sting me, but it stings religious performance, and I hope it really, really does. So it expresses judgment. His stories were expressing judgment. He's messing around with the Pharisees, and it says, after them challenging him, he told this story. And one of the stories he told was about the prodigal son. And the story isn't about some guy who wasted his life, but, you know, he came back to God. The story is about the son who stayed home and never attended the party at the end. Because he said, I worked all my life for you. You've never thrown a party. And the father came out and said, your brother's back. He's restored to all his privileges. And he was upset about it. He said, I've been performing my whole life and you've never thrown me a party. It's because you're no stinking fun. You've been trying to earn my favor and you don't understand. Everything I have is yours. Everything I have is yours. And you've been out there in the field every day. You wake up early, you're gone. I don't even have a time to have a coffee with you. But your son, who took his whole inheritance, he blew it. And when he came back, he smelt like puke and stink and yuck. And you know what I did? I went, clean yourself up. No, I hugged him. I embraced him. I got stinky with him. And we jumped around. <laughs> My son's home. He'll get right into your stink. Isn't that great? Man. And see, he told that story because these guys would not get in your stink. They were all in their high place. And, hey, I'm going to tell you how you can be like me. I don't know how to do that. I'm covered in mud. I stink. I smell. If you're really honest with yourself, there's some stink. Thank God Jesus took all the stink. All right, settle down. Settle down. The Good Samaritan, I love that one, right? He's talking to the Pharisees again. And then he, he tells them a story, and the hero in the story is the people they hate really, really bad. And he uses a priest, and he uses a teacher of the law. And he says, you know who really loves? Because the guy said, the guy said uh, you, know, uh, you know, what's the greatest commandment? Well, love the Lord your God with all your heart, your mind, your soul, your strength. Hallelujah. And we still preach that stuff. We're still preaching striving to people. Love with all your might, all your strength. I don't know what all is. I don't have a meter on me that says, boop. Hey, I finally got all the way there. I'm finally loving with my whole mind, my whole heart, my whole strength. I don't know. I don't know. I'm trying. I don't know. But you see, that's what the guy said. And then Jesus said, okay, knock yourself out and give that a go. So trying to justify himself, because he went, mm, that didn't go well. Um, oh, well, who is my neighbor? Well, let me tell you a story. And he told the story about the Good Samaritan to judge the religious self-righteousness in the leaders of the day. He's attacking self-righteousness everywhere. That's why he told stories, because he wanted you to know that to bear fruit, it's a gift of God. And he told stories to attack the self-righteous processes that were so dominant in the day. The wicked servants. I mean, I mean, when he came to get his fruit, I mean, he's, he's, they're killing the messengers, they're killing all that, and what will happen if I come myself? Will they kill me too? Yes, they did. And Jesus told all these stories. They're all forms of judgment. Quickly, the strategy. The strategy. The story, the sting, the strategy. You ready for the strategy? Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes it away. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. And a lot of people teach that if you don't bear fruit, brother, he's going to take you and throw you in the fire. That's not what it says. Later on, it says those who aren't in me, they do get thrown out. But he says everyone, that's why I put it in yellow just for you. Say what's in yellow with me. In me. See, in me means you're in Christ. And you know how you got in Christ? 1 Corinthians 1.30, of him we are in Christ. It's him who put us into union with God. Of him you are in Christ. So you know what? If you're not bearing fruit, you know what he does? He comes by. If you're really a vine dresser, you don't chop it off because you know you're going to wreck the whole vine. If there's a part of the vine that's fallen down, you lift it up. If it fell in the mud and it's a total mess, you don't chop it off. You pick it up. How many have ever had Jesus pick you up? How many have ever been a mud dweller just a little bit? Aren't you glad that God is, ah, I'm done with him. 
No, it says if you fall in the mud, he lifts you up. It's the same word that was used when Jesus said, pick up your mat and walk. He lifted it up. He didn't destroy it, cut it off and toss it. He picked it up. It's, it's used everywhere as lifted up. And yet these awful translators said, if you don't bear fruit, he's going to take you away. No, he's not going to toss you. You're in him. He can't toss away himself. He's not going to do that. He's not going to wreck this beautiful strategy, the system he began. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes it that it may bear more fruit. Because he's committed not only to a new heart, but he's committed to you bearing much fruit and fruit that remains. Mark 4, 24. And he said to them, be careful what you are hearing. The measure of thought and study you give to what you are hearing, the same measure of virtue and knowledge will come back to you. And more besides will be given to you when you hear. So you can hear. He said, it's been given to you to hear, and you can hear. But you know, we do need to, even this side of the covenant, let us hear well. Let us hear well. Let us, let us listen. Let us, let us meditate. Let us get deep into the things that God's saying. Peter pondered what he said. He said, hey, go out now. Launch out for a haul. And Peter's like, I just cleaned my nets. I'm going to go home and have a nap. You don't catch fish during the day. He pondered it for a minute and he said, you know what? That's crazy, but at your word. Not for any other reason, except I just heard that sermon. I just heard the strategy. And at your word, I'm going to give it a go. And he let that seed get into his heart and he did something very unnatural and uncommon. And he saw 30, 60, 100 fold. Amen, pastor. Thank you, pastor. Some good preaching. Proverbs 4, 20 and 27. Keep your heart with all diligence out of the issues of life. Thank God he gives me a new heart because all the issues of life come from your heart. And that word is tutsa. Just thought I'd share that with you. Boundaries, limits, borders, the extremity of your experience is determined by your heart condition. So whatever's, whatever's going on in your life, the boundaries of your experience are going to be affected by your heart condition. Your, your heart condition establishes the boundary of your present experience. The experience you're in right now is an expression and manifestation of your heart. So that's what it is. Ezekiel 36, though, says, I will give you a new heart. Say give. When is a gift not a gift? When you have to earn it or it's forced upon you. But it is an absolute gift. You don't have to earn it. It's not forced upon you. I will give you a new heart, and I'll put a new spirit within you. I'll take that heart of stone, and I'll give you that heart of flesh. I'll give you a heart, that, and I'll put my spirit in you, and I'll cause you to walk in my statues. You'll keep my judgments, and you will do them. Proverbs 20, verse 9. Who can say, I have made my heart clean, and I am pure from my sins? Who can say that? Who can say that? All, all heads bowed, eyes closed. Or heads closed, eyes bowed. I've... Is there anyone here who can say, Hey, did it myself. <laughs> yeah. I have finally arrived at the place where I am in the status that God could use me. Oh, hallelujah. Well, I wish I were you. And you know, all that's rubbish. And all of that sadly puts believers on a, a treadmill to nowhere. Who can say I've made my heart clean? <laughs> I love what David said, create me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. I love the way the message says it. The message says, God, make a fresh start in me. Shape a Genesis week from the chaos of my life. I love that, don't you? God, you know what? What a total mess. Lord, create a new heart in me. I mean, let's, let, let's have a Genesis week. That whole thing where you just spoke and everything responded. Let me have a Genesis week with you. Let me have a Genesis week from the chaos of my life. Don't throw me out on the trash. Don't fail me. Breathe your holiness into me. Acts 15, 8 and 9. So God, who knows the heart, acknowledged them by saying, by giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he did to us, and he made no distinction between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. They were the first Gentiles to come into the kingdom. And that's where Peter was like, wow, there's no distinction. The same way we got a new heart, the same way we got the Holy Spirit, God purified their hearts. Who purifies your heart? God purified their heart. How? By faith. God, you promised that you would give me a new heart, create a new heart within me. I believe that, and I thank you, and I receive it now in Jesus' name. Thank you for a heart that's fruitful. Thank you, thank you. 
I heard the tap, tap, tap. Romans 10, 8 and 10, just a little bit of strategy, a little bit of application. You ready? Come on, this is really important. Listen! Okay, thank you. The word is near you, it's in your mouth, and it's in your heart. The seed is near you, it's in your mouth, and it's in your heart. See, these two things are important. This is important. Turn to your neighbor and say, this is important. You want to get results. You want to get healing in your life from that guy who sawed through the drywall. Pay attention. All right. The word is near you. It's in your mouth. It's in your heart. For the, with the heart you believe unto righteousness, and with the mouth you confess unto salvation. That's not just a word that people have to use to get in the kingdom. That's how you continue in the kingdom. It's all about seed. You'll never understand the rest of this if you don't get this first parable clearly established in your life. Everything in the kingdom, fruitfulness in every realm of your life is all about the seed, the sower. It's all about the heart. It says, with your heart you believe. Your heart is your believing mechanism. How do I believe God? With your heart. So you believe in your heart. The heart is where you get these images of a preferred future. And your heart starts to conceive incredible things. And your heart starts to go, whoa! But then you know how it comes into expression? You confess it. That inspector has no power over our future. Don't care how many walls he tries to cut open this week. It's all in God's hands. He's going to make it work. He didn't bring it this far to throw us in the disc. So you know what? I declare right now that the favor of God is upon us. And now, from this point on, in the name of Jesus, I declare that favor is going to upon upon everyone who considers our cause. And everyone who sees Impact Church will immediately be struck with I've got to bless them. I've got to favor them. I've got to honor them. And we call that into expression and manifestation in Jesus' name because that's the truth about us. And we just push that over to the big fella and we say yes and amen. True story. In anything, in anything in your life, there's a word for you. There's a seed for you. Everything comes into you through seed. It's like I could be preaching about healing, and, and you're still pondering healing. You're still trying to figure out healing. Healing is something in my life. I was preaching in Jamaica on Wednesday, and I had words of knowledge for healing, and we had an amazing service, and I was preaching right from my office in the basement, and yet we were touching people all over Jamaica and actually Florida. There are people checking in from everywhere, but God was moving on that thing, and I had a revelation of people being healed and touched and broken through, but sometimes when I teach on healing, people receive it, and you're still like, does God heal today? Does that really still happen? And you see, your heart, there's still some hardness in your heart by false teaching and crazy things that you just got to dig that out and say, it really, really does. You know, you want that seed of healing. You want the seed of prosperity. You want the seed of God's blessing. You want the seed of, of patience. You want the seed of long suffering. You want that fruit to be manifest in your life. Provide that environment. Start to believe it. Meditate. Meditate on the word. Meditate on that seed. Let that seed get deep in you. And then here's how it's activated. I believe in healing. Your head's going, where are you going? Okay. You know what they found out? That you cannot think differently than what you say. You know, when you speak, your mind shuts down, and what you say dominates whatever you speak. Sorry, what you speak dominates whatever's going on in your head. You cannot, you just try it now. Think, I don't believe in healing, I don't believe in healing, I don't believe in healing. I believe in healing! I believe in healing! See, what you're doing is you're telling your mind to line up with your voice. And suddenly you start a new track in your head. And that track says, I'm not sure about the healing thing. You can't think that while you're saying, I believe in healing. So you get the revelation about God's healing power and you confess it over your life. You confess it over your life. And it's not the magic of confession. It's the fact that Jesus is the healer. So what you're doing is you're aligning yourself with the revelation. Jesus is the healer. Because confession doesn't heal you. Prayer doesn't heal you. God heals you. But you open the way for that to come by speaking in faith. And that will come and flow into your life. It works with anything. It works with anything in your life. And you'll never understand any of the other parables if you don't understand this strategy and this principle. And I've got to move on. I'd love to teach on this forever, but I can't. Then Christ will make his home in your hearts. As you trust in him, your roots will grow down into God's love and keep you strong. Mm -hmm.